VLC. Hi. Um, I'm going to do a presentation about uh, VideoLAN and VLC. Um, I am uh, Jean-Baptiste Kem from the VideoLAN project. I'm the president and I've been working on uh, VLC for uh, a long time, a bit too long probably. Um, so this presentation is going to be full of uh, cones um, and other nice stories. Please uh, stop me uh, if you don't understand what I'm saying or if I'm going too slow or too fast. Um, if you stop me and ask questions, it means that you're still alive and that's great and I prefer that. Um, <laughs> so this is a story that takes place in 1996, five, six. Uh, basically, um, here you can see um, is the campus of the Ecole Centrale Paris, which is an engineering school in the south of Paris. And um, basically, in this, it's one of the best uh, engineering school. And in the 1960s, um, the, the state said, well, it's named Centrale and we don't have any place to put it in Paris. So we're going to put it in the middle of France. Um, and the alumni said, oh, no way you can do that. Uh, we want you to stay. So what the alumni did were, was they bought this piece of land and then tell the French government, hey, we bought this land. We're going to build a campus. And at the top of the campus, you can build uh, the school. Don't worry, I'm still speaking about VLC. Um, and the, because of that, um, the school does not own the campus. And the, the campus, when it was installed, had a network that was managed by students. It was installed in the 1980s. It was amazing with um, a, a great technology called token ring. I don't know if anyone here still remembers those things. Um, it's a great thing and it was amazing. However, it's very bad if you want to, to play video games and especially when you're going to play Doom. Um, so in 1992 and 1993, the students started to ask the school, hey, can we have a new network? And the school said, ah, we're really sorry. This campus is not owned by us, so we can't do anything for you. Um, so they went and see a lot of partners, and then there is uh, someone from TF1, which is one of the main uh, broadcasting networks in France, said, OK, if you're able to destroy your token ring network by sending video on it, I pay you a new network. And we are in 1994, so there is Pentium, but no mix, decoding MBEC2 in uh, software was almost impossible, and we are like 10 years before YouTube. But they say, OK, let's do that. So they start the project, um, and they after two years, uh, they managed to have some streaming of the DVB satellite, and um, it was really cool. It was able to play 35 seconds of video and then crash because no memory left. But that's fine because the demo was 30 seconds and it was working. Uh, it was even multi-platform, I mean Linux and BOS. Uh, and after that, they say, well, okay, that's great. Let's start again and actually do that for, for other people. Um, so they rebooted the project in 1998 um, with a few ideas. The first one was open source. Um, second one was uh, modularity, which is one of the base of VLC. And this is one of the reasons why VLC became popular. And it was still network oriented because it was just a client for a streaming solution online. Um, in 2001, after two, three years of battling with the school, they managed uh, to relicense all the projects under GPL uh, because this, the school said, well, sorry, but you're our students, the, the IP is, our, is for us, um, but uh, the students won. Proprietary. Uh, the idea of the school is that they wanted to sell an MPEG-2 uh, uh, decoder video and audio because some guy of MIT made that uh, for the MPEG-1 uh, decoder. Yes. Sure. Um, so, but um, VLC is just one of the projects of the VideoLand project. Um, VLC was, at the beginning, just a VideoLand client, and of course there was a server. There were some completely crazy projects that are dead, like VLCS, which was a way to do uh, basically multicast of a, 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 a network that is not multicast by abusing VLANs and changing directly uh, people uh, from VLAN when you wanted to play a video. And, um, but more... Um, Lots of libraries for developers, including the famous uh, libdvd CSS to work around the DVD encryption and decryption, but also X2C4, um, 
probably the most used encoder in the world now, uh, and other stuff. Um, we have uh, stuff for libraries for decoding Dolby, um, DTS, and also all the Blu-ray stack. Uh, so at the beginning, this was basically the video land streaming solution. So on your left, you got the inputs, which could be anything, basically, whether it would be DVD, Blu-rays, acquisition card, DVB, uh, or even satellites. And then the restreaming on the network, after transcoding or not, um, a lot was uh, focused on the multicast network that we had at the Ecole Centrale Paris. And then uh, you have a few clients, whether they are VLC or not VLC. Um, so that's more or less the story, the history of... Uh, Project. Um, <clears throat> the problem is that we have to work with multimedia. So um, I guess everyone is familiar a lot with multimedia around here. Yes? Yes, okay, fine. So what is multimedia? Multimedia is stupidity at max. Um, so there are two things that I really tell, which is the first one is in multimedia, if there is a stupid way to do something, someone will do it badly and will complain until this is a standard and is supported. Uh, this is the thing we have to deal every day. Um, great ideas about having some wave audio put in MP4 um, formats remuxed in MKV or WebM and then stream over adaptive streaming with a, co a different codec for, uh, for audio, of course, that is going to change every time you change the bitrate. Stuff like that. Um, and it also, the problem also is that in multimedia, everyone thinks he understands everything, but actually no one does. Uh, the more I do multimedia, the more I realize that I don't know anything. Uh, the problem is that many people, um, including from big companies, um, including people from YouTube and so on, believe they know everything and, and then try to do something and then they realize that it is uh, complex. Um, so the result of that is that in multimedia, uh, technically everything is broken. Um, there are 42 ways to do something. All the containers, so a container is a, basically the box, the format to put the different video and audio tracks. All of them are between complete crap um, and to somewhat, somehow broken. Um, the worst, of course, are AVI, uh, but at least it has the excuse of being from the 1980s. Uh, FLV, which is probably the one the most used on the web those days, great, or ARG. Um, also, too many codecs have bad designs. Uh, most of the codecs are badly encoded because someone found a script online and added a few stuff. And many just put something inside something else. The reason is that, for example, you have a, an encoder that is very expensive, um, but everything else in your uh, post-processing channel is only understanding these formats. And you can't you should buy a new compatible encoder, but it's going to cost you money. So it's easier to like, work around and hack it in order to put it in it. So for example, we have amazing stuff like H.265 put in um, FLVs or AVI using the direct show format of Windows 95. And people complain on the mailing list all the time to support that. Um, yes. Um, the rest is that it's not about only codecs and, and, and containers, but metadata also is very broken. Um, how do you put a, a, an image inside um, FLAC or ORG? Uh, well, it's great because ORG has metadata that is only comments, uh, text comments. So you're going to take your image, uh, basically base64 it, um, and put it in a text field inside a binary format. Amazing. <laughs> there are two ways of um, having basically the metadata of H.264, and some, some encoders, even on the same platform, uh, some decoders want it in one format or on the other one. Uh, for example, on Android, depending on the chip that is going to do the hardware decoding, you need to put one format or the other, uh, and so on. I don't even speak about DRM, uh, because DRM is always bad, but... The thing is, um, in multi um, open source is absolutely everywhere. Uh, it's used by almost everyone, all the TVs, um, most of the, of, the, um, of the smartphone have some part of uh, open source codecs that were developed by the FFmpeg and the LibAV project. Um, and, and it's used by a large, um, in large kind of domains from, from TV station to hospitals to education. However, there is a big problem. The first one is the USA. 
Um, the, the multimedia community is underrepresented in the USA because of patents mostly, and everyone is afraid of that. So m a lot of multimedia engineers uh, in, in the USA who work on Floss Multimedia are basically working on wrappers around Codex in order to never touch the Codex. Um, a lot of the projects are abandoned. We have a lot of forks. Um, and the, we can't say that uh, most of the open source software and multimedia are easy to use. And VLC, uh, I'm also to blame on that. Um, also, the professional in the broadcast is still um, fighting against open source um, uh, software uh, on their field. Um, but that's not really important. Um, multimedia is not that difficult, technically. Um, of course, because I'm working on that. But it's mostly about knowing a lot of those quirks, uh, knowing a lot of those formats and uh, of those subtitles. It's, not, it's way easier to code on VLC or even on some codec than working on a kernel, for example. Anyway, um, VLC. So VLC is um, a media player. It used to be the video land client. Um, usually when I go and introduce myself and say, well, you know, I work on VLC. No one knows about that. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know the cone that plays videos? Oh, yes, that works every time. Um, it's insanely popular. Um, the reason of the cone, the cone was selected is a very old story of the Ecole Centrale Paris that I can't really explain on a microphone. Uh, but yes, there was a bit too much um, alcohol in, in this story. Um, but it's great because it's, um, it is completely stupid to decide to take a cone as a, um, a logo for a software, but it's an amazing idea because it's so recognizable. Uh, it's, everyone knows, I mean, no other media player has a cone. Uh, everyone has a, just a play, basically a play button somewhere. So that was a great marketing idea by people who had no clue what they were doing. Um, VLC is known because it's everything. Um, mostly it was, um, so in the beginning, of course, it was only on the right uh, platforms, um, Linux and BOS, as I was saying. Uh, but VLC integrated all the codecs on Windows, and so you didn't have to download something else. Um, and if, even if you were downloading something else, it wouldn't change VLC. Everything is self-contained inside VLC, and that made it popular. So we play most of the formats, and we're working on that. So VLC tries to play everything and also tries to play it everywhere. Uh, everywhere, including OS2, because the last version of VLC has finally been fixed on OS2. The three developers are very happy. Uh, they don't have any users yet. Uh, but also, we are now on Android, on iOS. Uh, we're working on Windows Phone and everywhere. Um, and of also, uh, of course, on Linux, which was the original port. So how big is VLC? Our VLC is around 1 million downloads per day on our website. Uh, and that's um, not counting, of course, any Linux distribution. This is um, not counting every download.com and all those other places. Uh, over, when we started counting in 2006, since then we've had some 2 billion downloads, um, which is kind of nice knowing that uh, we are a very small team. Um, so VLC can play audio CD, DVDs, Blu-rays lately, mostly non-encrypted, but if you're smart, you can have them uh, decrypt also. Network stream, external hardware for the DVB uh, satellites, and the TV, the TV inputs, also the cameras. Um, so basically, everything that you could play, we try to make it playable. So I'm going to show you a few historical uh, viewers VLC. So here you can see the first DVDs uh, that was played uh, with... Uh, um, with Videoland client, as you can see. Um, it's, uh, of course, a GoldenEye DVD, and that's the reason why all of the code names of VLC until 1.0 were from GoldenEye characters. Uh, it's a GNOME, I don't know, one something, maybe, or something very, very old. Um, and this one is, uh, I think, the GTK UI we had in early GNOME 2. Um, that is, uh, of course, amazing design, as usual. Uh, but what's interesting is that it's a basically playback of a multimedia TS stream uh, direct live. This is the first UI we had on, on, um, on Mac, uh, and you still see it's, it said uh, video client. The, this is the version that is based on WLUT. 
um, that uh, was the most known and was the one that most people used and when VLC became uh, popular. Um, it was great and stayed a long time until we switched um, to Qt in 2008-2009. And, well, VLC runs also on GNOME 3 and it's the best thing because, you know, ponies. So, um, it's important to say that um, we are uh, mostly volunteers and a very, very, very large part of us are volunteers work on our free time. Uh, so we are really on the bazaar side uh, of the scope, um, even if we have one of the most used um, software um, for normal users. Um, since 2009, we have uh, now a non-profit organization that is behind uh, who gets a bit of donation in order to send people to LCA. And that's the main goal, of course. Uh, we organize um, Video Land Dev Days, which is a big conference about multimedia, where most of the people from the multimedia community, uh, most of the people from FMPEG, LibAV, X264, uh, come, come by. Um, everything we do, basically all the collaboration is done, of course, online since very early. Uh, we've moved to Git in 2007, so a bit before uh, everyone else except the Linux kernel, of course. Um, and everything we do is on IRC and mailing list. If you're not on IRC, basically you're not in the project. And we have a few, a few simple rules. Um, the core team of VLC is between five and 10, depending on how you count, or maybe three if you count differently. Uh, but we have a lot of uh, these contributors arriving, um, 150 per year, they come, they give us a patch and they go away. Um, which makes it uh, a bit weird on how we accept code. Um, the way we accept code is not based on is this feature really useful, but it's mostly is this feature going to be maintainable? Because of course everyone comes and says, well, I'm going to maintain this patch. Yes, sure. Uh, I'm going to stick. Yeah, technically no one does. Um, so we have absolutely no marketing team, uh, almost no legal team. Um, but what's important is that um, the technical code is correct and standard, and, and people who code more have the more power in the community. Uh, most of the time we arrive to consensus, and sometimes we offer some people to fork, uh, but so far there is no important VLC fork, um, except by us. Um, we, we use Git in a SVN way, <laughs> which is uh, we always rebase uh, before committing, so we don't have the, lots of uh, merge, merge uh, commits. And we have basically a master that we break and commit to, and a stable branch where we cherry pick uh, commits. Uh, I think that's pretty standard. So one of the main questions is why v is VLC, why did it become so popular? Um, and they are weird reasons, but there are also technical reasons. And the main ones are because it was modular, uh, because it was network oriented, and because it was written in a sane language. Uh, so why is the networking oriented uh, important? Uh, mostly because, well, when you were in the 2003 and 2004, and you were using Emule or Idonkey, of course, no one of you were doing that, I'm sure, and you started to download something, it would take, I don't know, half a day or a day or more, um, and if you try to play it with any other player, it will just complain that the file is not complete. But as the VLC was developed as a network uh, engine, a uh, playback engine, it would just like ignore and try to go directly. So for example, if you were downloading a Disney movie after like only 50 megabytes or maybe even less, you were able to see if it was actually a Disney movie and not an adult one, or if you were looking for an adult one, then it was not a Disney movie. Um, so that's quite important and that helped a, a lot um, in having VLC used. Um, the other reason, it was mostly on Mac OS, that it was the only way to play DVDs for a long time. Um, so, VLC does not exist, and I'm sorry to say that. Um, VLC is a 200 lines of code wrapper around libvlc, which is our API to basically create media players. Um, libvlc is a very stable API above a core, um, and everything else is done in modules. This um, module design um, is one of the reasons why VLC also was popular, is that you, when you want to do a cross-platform um, video engine, for example, um, you're going to take, I don't know, you're going to, one idea is to say, well, I'm going to pick OpenGL because OpenGL works everywhere, right? 
Well, if you ever use OpenGL on Windows or even on some Linux cards, you know that's not the case. Um, so having different modules that you can take the best technology on every platform. This is why we are able to have uh, to maintain an OS2 port without destroying the code base. Because basically it's modules that no one cares about except the OS2 maintainers. This helps VLC to spread on numerous platforms and especially on non-open source ones. Um, it's also good because it helps uh, the code maintainability because then most of the units are 1,000 lines of code, more or less. So the core, uh, LibVLC core, yes, as you've seen, the project is very bad with names. Um, so it was VideoLand client that became VLC and then everything is LibVLC, LibVLC core. Um, so the core is quite light. It's basically doing the operating system abstraction, it's able to do memory allocations, mostly networking, uh, thread handlings, and loading modules, uh, depending on the platform. It's also able to do clock synchronization, which is basically synchronizing audio and video together. Um, everything else is outside. So VLC, the core VLC doesn't support any codec, doesn't understand what a codec is almost, um, and is uh, quite simple. Above that, uh, we have a stable API. So libvlc core is not stable. Uh, we break the API and the API of, uh, quite often. Uh, but above that, we have this simple multimedia framework called libvlc that is done to actually write applications. Um, and then we have bindings for all the uh, major languages, uh, especially because we have a binding in Swig where we can generate them uh, for other people. Um, to give you an idea, um, in a usual uh, VLC installation on Linux, you have 300 modules uh, that goes from codec to I.O., video output. Um, and if you want a new feature or a format of like, I don't know, Commodore 64 um, uh, mod chip files like people did, you just add a new module uh, and submit it to the play. Um, VLC is around 820,000 lines of code. Um, so the core is 100, 120,000, uh, and everything else is inside the modules. Um, what's also quite interesting is that the core depends on almost nothing except libc and uh, iconv, but the modules depend on a lot of external libraries, including libavi codec, libavi format, and so many others. Um, when you compile the whole VLC um, for Windows or for uh, embedded Linux, usually it's 10 to 12 million lines of code that you, that you build. Uh, the VLC on Android version is a bit less because we don't have streaming, but it's around 6 million and a half. Uh, most of it is C, like 50%, and then uh, the rest is C++ and assembly. So VLC's code is in this uh, amazing language called C++ minus minus, or call it as you want, some C object, which is basically abusing um, C in order to have a kind of object abstraction and having, um, having um, pointer to function like structs that are pointing to other opaque structures. Um, and that's how we do uh, different modules, but it seems to work quite fine. Uh, most of the modules have their own uh, private data on each, uh, on each um, session. And, and this is mostly how it works. Um, a lot of media players are written in C++, for example. And um, when VLC was starting, the C++ compilers were uh, way um, limited, were more limited. And when we see, of course, when we compile C++ modules in VLC, they are very um, So having that helps also on importability, because ports were done without C++ at all. So how does um, technically VLC uh, does video output? Um, it's a no, no network-oriented graph uh, that it's built at runtime when you want to play something. Uh, this is quite similar like, as what GStreamer, QuickTime, DirectShow, MediaFunction is doing. is based on what is probing and from the stream going to ask for different modules. Um, so the first part is uh, usually the protocol, uh, HTTP, but also file or DVB. It's basically a way to get from a URL, uh, get a stream, a raw stream. Then you got the format, uh, which is basically the thing that is going to split the video and um, audio um, tracks and subtitle tracks. And then based on that, it's going to have um, a video decoder, or an audio decoder, a subtitle decoder, that are going then to video filters and then to the output, or for audio filters, the same, audio filters and the output. 
For subtitles that are text-based, we usually have um, something, a text renderer, like free type, and then we blend it uh, in the, on the video output in order to display it. But also with VLC, because it's a full media framework, you can re-encode directly and restream, remux and restream, uh, if you want to use VLC, um, to do uh, streaming. Uh, as you can see, interfaces are also modules in VLC, um, which is something that people usually don't expect. Um, and interfaces are, are module of uh, libvlc core, it's, and it's not the interface that is built on libvlc. There is a small difference from other media players uh, and other multimedia framework is that if you look closely on the left, you're going to see that the first two arrows are basically not on the right, right direction. Um, basically, it's the formats, um, the demuxer, that is going to ask for more data from the protocol layer, saying, hey, you know what, I need data, and is going to ask it data. Um, so, for example, when you go on YouTube, it's basically doing a lot of stuff uh, on the server side to, to, that you get most of the data soon, and then um, going to throttle your connection. But if you're going to launch a YouTube video and you have lots of connection, what's going to happen is that you're going to download almost everything without playing back. Uh, and so if you close, you lose a lot of, uh, of resources. On VLC, it's not done like that. Um, basically, you have for every uh, protocol a set caching that is done in milliseconds. Uh, so for example, for a file, we're going to need 30, 300 milliseconds or for HTTP, two seconds. And so we are going to as soon as we miss data, we are going to ask the protocol layer to get this fixed uh, band um, caching. That's interesting because it's helped uh, saving resources and network resources. I'm not sure people actually care about that anymore, but that's something. So how do we do a module probing? Um, so every module has a what we call a capability. Basically, it's the category of the, of the module. Is it going to be an access, so protocol, DMUX, format opener, codex, or filters, mainly? And what it has in a capability and a score. So what the core of VLC is that going is that it's going to ask for all the modules of the right capability um, and in dec decreasing uh, score order, and then it's going to run the prop function and check if it's yes or no. If it's yes, then fine. Uh, if it's no, it goes to the next one. Um, and that's pretty simple because you can add new categories if you want to have some special modules. Um, but the problem is that, as you can see, it's, it can be quite slow, which is why we have a module cache in VLC so that when you're going to open the codex, you're not going to open everything, uh, every module, but just the right ones. So libvlc, libvlc is almost uh, a full multimedia framework. Uh, why do I say almost? Is that in, te in theory it could do everything that other multimedia framework. In practice, uh, the API so far is mostly done for playback. So basically, you want to play a video inside an application, or you want to do a different media player based on VLC. So it's mostly playback, filters, all the control you want with libvlc, um, but. Well, there is very limited streaming. We've done DVD reapers and CD uh, reapers based on libvlc. We've done subnailers also um, for, um, for libvlc, so in Nautilus or, or in GNOME. Um, and it's also directly used in the port of VLC on iOS, on Android and Windows Phone and, and, and the others. Uh, it's also used by Phonon. We have a Phonon backend that is probably not the best one. Uh, and it's also used by external projects that we don't know about because uh, libvlc is LGPL, so people can use it uh, as they wish. So just to give you an idea, um, VLC is extremely simple, libvlc is extremely simple to use for the main use case, which is basically you create a VLC instance, which is libvlc new, once again, amazing names, as you can see, and then you, uh, we create one or more media players because in an application, you might want to play more than one video. Um, and then we create a media, which is basically usually get a new media from a location, which is a, a URL. We set it and we play. Um, we have an uh, example of the VLC to have an almost full media playback for GTK based on that takes 150 lines of code that has play, pause, stop, and even synchronization of audio. So it is done for that. It is very simple to do for that. Um, and it's even uh, simpler if you reflect it with Python and so on. 
Questions? Still alive? Okay, we'll see. Um, so now I'm going to show you a few stuff that you don't know about VLC that are quite funny. Um, <clears throat> for certain definition of funny, of course. Uh, VLC is extendable in Lua, so all the uh, internal APIs are mostly exposed, so you can do sharing on Twitter, and also um, to do uh, parsing of websites. So if you put a YouTube URL inside VLC, VLC is going to act like a web browser that just is able to play video, and is going inside and then with a URL and some regex, is basically going to give you the URL and play it without destroying your machine because you're still using Flash. Um, <clears throat> VLC also has something called uh, service discovery, so basically you can f find playlists. So it's really used for UPnP, Samba, but also SAP, um, and also you could like do playlists uh, directly, like, um, and it can give you some stuff like that where you have uh, a repository of video of podcasts and you integrate directly with VLC in in crypto. Uh, VLC can do screencasting, which is. Um, completely useless because VLC screencasting is very bad, but it gives you the unique opportunity of doing this joke that is useful, but everyone loves, um, which is an infinite uh, VLC. So every, I don't know, every six months there is some guy on, on Reddit, on Twitter doing that and then retweeted everywhere. Uh, it's useless, therefore it's great. Um, <clears throat> we can do mosaic uh, in VLC, and that's important because now you see that VLC is not just a media player. Because to do a mosaic, basically, you need to have not one input, but here, 20 inputs uh, that are decoded in 20 different decoders and then merge at, at the, the, the display time. And then you can even, instead of displaying, re-encode that. So it, people do mosaics directly in VLC instead of buying some, and that's by default in VLC, and you don't need to code anything to get that. We can do, of course, picture-in-pictures or wall filters, um, so that's really cool if you want to, um, <clears throat> if you want to not, to have big screens and not spend too much money and you have just a few HDMI, HDMI TVs. We play karaoke, because why not? Uh, we of course play MIDI because it's the most important format on earth. Um, <laughs> We have, uh, of course, a console uh, and Curses interface because, well, we live in command line, right? So who needs a UI? Actually, I don't, but it's still using X11 to or, or OpenGL to output. So if you're over SSH, well, you're going to use Libcaca directly, which allows you to, um, to be able to watch a movie uh, directly on the server through SSH. Amazing, very useful. I want to this ASCII art. Um, we have, of course, a web interface uh, where either you can uh, control and have it playing locally or restream and re-encode in a video HTML5 or VLC-compatible format. And so many other uh, weird features that we have that are useless but great to use. Especially in the next version of VLC, we have a VHS filter. Uh, the idea of the VHS filter is basically you take your good video that's full HD and then you add artifacts and, and random uh, problems on it to, to remind you of the VHS times. We also have a, a, a puzzle, we also have a puzzle um, interface because, well, basically you're watching a movie that is boring, but you want to watch it so you can actually click and move the, uh, I can show you uh, after, if we have time, I'm not sure. Uh, a bit more serious, we've spent a bit too much time lately on VLC on Android. Um, so VLC on Android is completely open source. We work and support from 2.1 to 5.0. Uh, it's it has all the format that VLC does, except it doesn't do streaming yet. And the biggest difference is it has an actual media library for audio, so you actually can use it for audio. While on the desktop, not much. Um, porting to Android was difficult, um, mostly because the libc of Android is very bad and because instead of taking one that was already um, used, they decided to rewrite one and they had no clue what they were doing. Um, so there is no good way to output audio uh, on Android yet. Uh, it's very difficult to output YUV in a standard way on Android. 
but after almost uh, two years, uh, we are finally able to. Uh, so we released something in July 2012 uh, as a beta, and then it quickly evolved to be uh, less ugly. That was the version that was quite popular. And now we almost finished the to of Google of two years ago, and they change it again. Um, the good news is that we already uh, are on the next design. Um, um, yes, so, yes, we have a lot of, I think we have three users uh, on Android, which is quite nice. Uh, we also have a port uh, on iOS, uh, which is bad, but uh, quite interesting because it works faster than Android. Uh, even without our hardware decoding. And lately we've been porting to VLC on Windows RT, which is the Metro UI. Uh, we don't really care about the Metro UI, but what we care about is mostly uh, Windows Phone. Future projects, well, the, one of the, them is a port on Windows RT, Windows Phone, I was saying. Uh, we are not going to work on Firefox OS because porting VLC to JavaScript with no thread is not possible. Um, VLC for Ubuntu phone, or maybe it's called Touch now, we don't know if there is anything actually to do. Uh, BlackBerry, probably not, because they can now run Android application directly. And for Chrome OS, we hope to do exactly the same. So, almost my last slide. Um, should contribute to VLC and to LibLC. The first thing is to use it and promote it and say it's awesome your friends, uh, report bugs, because you know there are lots of bugs, send samples, and also code on VLC or use libvlc in your next uh, project. Thank you. I think we have five minutes for questions. Want? No one wants. Is, is this working? Is there any traction on um, So we have a Chromecast streaming module in VLC. So the problem is that the, Chrome, the goal of Chromecast is basically to play something from the cloud, right? So it's a full, um, so it's basically the Chromecast is going to pull and it's really not done for pushing to it, right? Um, so for VLC on Android, it's very simple. We know where the file is, we could just send it, right? But then it's only the compatible part. So what we did is a, a full streaming um, uh, module that is merged in VLC 3.0 uh, and that is able to push and re-encode all the time to the right format. However, because of that, um, when you seek or when you pause, basically on the Chromecast, you're posing on the Chromecast, right? And so the streaming is still going on. So when you resume, there is a lot of issue because of the timestamp that should increase. And of course, and also the Chromecast is very broken in the time, type format they support. And yeah. so it is coming and you can try it already. Uh, it works, but I'm not sure it's actually working for like normal uh, end users. Okay, thank you. So, other questions? No, no questions? Yeah. Sure. Uh, by C minus uh, minus, is there a separate place where that's documented, or is it just a set of conventions for the way that uh, you guys do object stuff? <laughs> no, it's not. It? It's mostly an internal joke. It's not really. Um, yeah. It's more, not really standardized. Um, I know a lot of projects are doing it. Um, a lot of the old uh, VLC developers were really against C++, but the way it's done is um, mostly a, a funny joke, and it works fine for our use case, which is to have like a minimal abstraction for modules where you don't know what's inside without having a m big uh, inheritance and so on. And um, uh, in terms of hardware acceleration, is there uh, like uh, much in, in the way of the module support for uh, 2D and 3D acceleration? You mentioned GL, but that it's not everywhere. So what do you mean by acceleration? Ah, well, I just mean, uh, I've, I've been at a talk recently about OpenCL and stuff, so I'm just always interested in ways of offloading CPU load. So when we speak about, so, 
for the multimedia project, when they speak about hardware acceleration, what they want is decoding acceleration. Because for a long time, we always, already have um, we already have hardware acceleration for the display, which is Direct 3D, or OpenGL, or Xvideo, which are basically able, so we can actually ask the GPU to mostly do the chroma conversion or scale, because doing that on the CPU is stupid and takes a lot of. But the biggest discussion lately, especially on Linux, where we have two or three different APIs, um, is uh, hardware acceleration, which is a decoding part. And the problem is that you can't, most of the codecs are very difficult to do in OpenCL, for example. So usually it's um, kind of DSP parts who are directly inside the, um, inside the GPU. VLC supports hardware acceleration on all platforms, but on some platform it does it in a bad way, which is it sends the data to the GPU, ask it for the code, and then gets the data back from the GPU, do the filtering, and then displays it. But most of the time, this uh, get data back is very slow uh, because it's not what you use, you're used to do for GPUs. Usually you send stuff, you never get it back. And also it's doing mem copies. And as uh, we say in multimedia, mem copies murder um, because it's basically murdering your CPU. Um, so what we do is what we call the full GPU acceleration where you send the data, and you made it decode by the GPU, and then you're going to control the GPU in a different way to when it's going to display it. And we have that, but not in all uh, platforms and not all the APIs. Uh, but it's going to get fixed for 3.0 for all of them. Yes, maybe I can show you the puzzle uh, if I find, again, I'm still taking questions if you want. Yes. No, no questions? Okay. I hope it's going to work. And no, it's not going to work. Ah. So of course I broke my tree because else it's not funny. And yes, okay, so I don't have a working VLC, which is, <laughs> which is not that surprising. Um, I'm, I don't watch video anymore, I think. I have never time, and every time I got it, I break it. Oh yes, I do. Yes. So then I can do uh, that, <laughs> and this is probably going to be around here, right? And um, yeah, it's supposed to be an easy video because there is something written on it. But oh yes, I got the corner. Um, so yeah, wow, I got one corner, right? And then what the. F <laughs> Yes, uh, we're getting there, right? So anyway, um, completely useless, but therefore completely necessary. If there is no questions, I will stop on that. Yes, there is one question. Yes? How do you go about getting add-ons like that? This is a video filter. So basically it's taking video uh, frames in and then doing video frames out. And then all the video filters can actually capture the mouse and, uh, and the clicks. And that's how we do it. And then there is some kind of Bezier um, things to draw it. But the code is open source, so you can check it out, and I can help to, you to improve it. Thank you. And on behalf of RCA, we just have a small token. Oh, thank you. How do I disconnect that?